All right, welcome back to another After Dark, everyone. Hope you all are having a good night so far. Um, another player I have, uh, I mention all the time in, uh, in, in these reactions, but haven't actually done like the background for him is Dirk freaking Nowinski. Um, underrated as all hell, champion, did it the right way, stayed on one team, never caused any problems. Very similar guy to like Tim Duncan with much less success, but as far as the mentality and the attitude, they were very coachable, you know, very, very solid people, very solid individuals out there on the court, and they worked their asses off, and they earned what they got. So I thought it was time to talk about Dirk, um, and I popped up a video so we can like at least get all the all the essential info. Uh, video from Nonstop. So this one's called "How Good Was Dirk Nowinski Actually," and um, I'm gonna link the original video down below if you want to check it out without my commentary. Go right ahead. And everybody else, please leave this video a like. Um, it helps out the channel a lot. And yeah, I'm excited about this. I'm sure there's a lot about Dirk I actually don't know. So, all right, y'all ready? Let's do it. He was a 14-time All-Star. He won one NBA title, and he scored 31,560 points, the sixth best mark ever. Here is the career retrospective of Dirk Nowitzki. Let's his do weird it. basketball upbringing, his early NBA struggles, and the story of the greatest loyalty in NBA history. Oh, I forgot he had a like a, a German coach that was always working with him individually. Road to the NBA, Holger, ballet, saxophone, and basketball. Saxophone? When someone mentions Dirk Nowitzki and his successful NBA career, one man has to be mentioned as well. Yep. It's not his father, it's not Mark Cuban, or any of his teammates. His name is Holger Geschwindner, and he was to Dirk what Mr. Miyagi was to the Karate Kid, yeah. what Yoda was to Luke Skywalker, and what Mickey was to Rocky Balboa. Oh, good Holger call, was the Mickey. captain of the German basketball team at the 1972 Olympics, and in 1993, at the age of 48, he was competing in the third German league for fun. While he was waiting for his game to start, Holger watched a youth basketball game, and that's when he first noticed a tall skinny and blonde kid who didn't have much technique but had an innate ability to find spots on the floor where he could be effective. Holger approached him and three weeks later he and Dirk started practicing together every day and if you had to choose one word to describe those practices that word would be weird. Mm -hmm. Nowitzki started shooting with his left leg raised and then his right. He shot free throws, threes, and bank shots with his right and left hand. Dirk learned to play the guitar to improve the strength and rhythm of his fingers. Get out of here. I mean, it works as a, as a fellow guitar player. Yeah, it does work, but I never heard of that being part of basketball training. He learned to dance the waltz and ballet to improve his footwork. Wow. He played the saxophone to boost his sense of improvisation. Because Holger what studied mathematics hell? and physics, he made a formula for the ideal jump shot for Dirk his height, length of his shooting arm, and the point of release as parameters, calculating that Dirk needs to shoot with a 60-degree angle. From the outside looking in, Holger was perceived as a mad scientist with highly unorthodox methods, which made zero sense at first. But just like Wax On, Wax Off taught karate moves to Daniel-san, and just how Mickey yeah, made Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just catch the check-in. Oh, man. It'll make you fast like Grease Lightning he catch a chicken to improve his foot speed, Holger's methods made a huge difference in the long run. After a few years of this crazy training routine, Dirk's footwork and balance were impeccable, and he could shoot from anywhere on the court. When Dirk was 19, he was- I guess that's why he looked clumsy out there, but he wasn't clumsy at all. You know, he, he, I, I always compare him to like, uh, you know, a, a drunken master in, 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 uh, in martial arts. You know, it looks like you don't know what the hell you're doing, but you know exactly what the hell you're doing already averaging 28 points per game. Damn. He pushed his home team Würzburg to the first division and was named the best basketball player in the country. Coming to America and early NBA struggles. Dirk was relatively anonymous prior to 1998 when he accepted an invite to Nike Hoop Summit where he was supposed to play on a world team against the best US high school players. Nowitzki dominated the game. Hey, is that D Rose? Supposed to play on a world team against the best US uh, so blurry, I can't tell. ...high school players. Nowitzki dominated the game, finishing with 33 points and 14 rebounds in the world team's 104-99 win, setting Hoop Summit records that would stand for more than a decade. He was a seven-footer that was dribbling the ball coast-to-coast -coast like a guard who made two three-pointers and 19 out of 23 free throws. 
nobody could stop him, and about half the U.S. players fouled out by trying. It was Dirk's coming out party, and the Dallas Mavericks GM Donnie Nelson had his mind set on who he was going to select in the 1998 NBA draft. Even though the German press killed Nowitzki and Holger for leaving in the middle of the season and missing a game for his personal gain, the risk paid off. Three months after the Hoop Summit, Dirk was selected ninth overall by the Milwaukee Bucks, who then traded him to the Mavericks for Robert Tractor Trailer. Despite Whoa, the huge, Robert Tractor Trailer? Ooh, that didn't, that didn't age well. Huge potential the Mavs saw in him. Dirk's rookie NBA season was a pure fight for survival. He was a 20-year-old in a new country, and he didn't speak English that well yet. The physicality and the fast pace of the NBA game were what he struggled with the most, and he couldn't guard anybody on defense. Yeah, Dirk yeah. even wanted to return home at one point but he persevered. In his second season, the Mavs got bought by Mark Cuban, who invested a lot of money into training facilities, travel, and sports science. At the same time, things also started to fall into place for the blonde German. He improved from 8 points per game to 17. He grew stronger and got accustomed to physical play. And his That left shrimp. Yeah. If you know, you know. Shooting touch came alive as a result. As a 39% three-point shooter, Dirk was invited to the three-point competition at the 2000 All-Star Game, becoming the tallest player ever to participate and finishing second. Nowitzki also finished as runner-up for the Most Improved Player Award behind Jalen Rose, which marked the beginning of a new era for the Mavericks. Big three era and getting close to the top. Big three is a phrase you often hear in the NBA. The Mavs also had theirs in the early 2000s. It's crazy. I always had a weird feeling about these Dallas Mavericks back then because it was like, I see you as a son. I see you as a son, you know, like Phoenix Suns. And it's, it's funny because by the time they did win a championship, they had Jason Kidd and Sean Marion, both ex-Phoenix Suns on that team. So there's always been this like trade-off between Phoenix and Dallas for some reason. With Nowitzki, small forward Michael Finley, and Steve Nash, who was Dirk's best friend. Dirk established himself as a true superstar in 2001, which was the first of his 11 consecutive All Star years, and 11 consecutive years that the Mavs would clinch a playoff spot. Dallas had the best offense in the league for three years in a row, from 2002 until 2004, and they could score against anybody. But in the postseason, a lack of defensive presence always made them hit a wall. Yep. It was either the Spurs or the Kings with better defense. Defense, better centers, or simply more luck. In 2005, Cuban was reluctant to offer more than $9 million per year for Steve Nash, who returned to Phoenix. Ironically, it was Nash and the Suns who then ousted the Mavs out of the 2005 playoffs, which caused another roster overhaul. NBA Finals. Yep, and Cuban admits that, you know, nowadays that was a big mistake. Big mistake. With the new coach Avery Johnson, the Mavs made great strides on defense in 2006, especially in the pick and roll, which was always Dirk's Achilles heel. Dirk won the three-point contest in the All-Star game that season, and the Mavs won 60 games with a number one offense in the NBA. In the playoffs, Dallas finally defeated Tim Duncan and the Spurs in seven games, with a masterful 37-point, 15-rebound effort by Nowitzki in Game 7. The conference finals offered a new duel against his good buddy Nash and the Suns, who stopped Dallas a year earlier. In pivotal Game 5 on the road, Dirk played one of the best games of his career, finishing with 50 points and 12 rebounds. With a win in Game 6 at home, the Mavericks finally advanced to the NBA Finals, their first Finals appearance in 26 years as a franchise. It seemed like they were also going yeah, but then they met Dwayne Wade. Dwayne Wade! To win their first championship with a 2-0 lead in the series, and a 15-point lead in the middle of the fourth quarter of Game 3. But with a few referee calls that didn't go their way and the phenomenal performance from Dwayne Wade, Dallas couldn't pull through. By the end of the series, Riley had rotated James Posey and Udonis Haslam at Nowitzki, and Dirk had no real answers to their aggressiveness. The Heat won the title in six games. Dirk was still ringless, and Cuban had been fined $250,000 for going onto the floor to yell at officials. Continued excellence and playoff disappointments. <laughs> Dallas came back even stronger in the 2007 season. They won 67 games and had the best record in the league, and Dirk was magnificent. He averaged 25 points in nine rebounds, shot 50-40-90 for the season, becoming only the fifth player in history to average those shooting percentages for the entire season. The Mavs were supposed to walk over the eighth-seeded Golden State in the playoffs, but it wasn't the case. The team that is now forever known as the We Believe Warriors defeated the Mavericks 
in six games, becoming the first number eight seed in NBA history that had beaten the number one seed in a best of seven series. Yeah, that We Believe team was was insane. Insane. Baron Davis, man, that's another dude who doesn't get talked about enough. Nowitzki averaged nearly five points less than his regular season average in that series and shot 38% from the field as compared to 50% during the regular season. Some of the media called him soft, a choker, and proclaimed Wait, that what was that? The, the shooting discrepancy? Regular season average in that series and shot 38% from the field as compared to 50% during the regular season. Damn, so damn. Uh, who was guarding him? Who was guarding him in that series? Somebody was locking him down. Some of the media called him soft, a choker, and proclaimed that he'll never win a title. After the series, it was announced that Dirk won the MVP award, and he thus became the first European player to win the most valuable player. However, Dirk was in a sour mood, and yep. he later called this the lowest point of his career. I know, Over yeah, imagine that. You win MVP, but that's the lowest moment of your career. He, he felt like a, he had imposter syndrome at that point. Which is why I'm really glad he ended up winning and and you know it, it all have it all worked out in the end. But at this point, I totally get it. Getting getting your ass kicked in the first round, the biggest disappointment in playoff history, and then you get presented with the MVP award right afterwards. It's like, yeah, obviously I'm not the most valuable player. You know, like I I, I get that. I get how he feels. Joel Embiid would have been like crying in, in joy if he got that MVP. But you know. There are differences. Some people actually want to win. Dirk wanted to win. Joel Embiid, I haven't figured that out yet. I think he just wants individual awards. But anyways, <laughs> let's move on. Uger then took him on a five-week trip to Australia and New Zealand, and they lived in wildlife, intense, with no contact with the outside world or the NBA. Wow. Dirk recovered and bounced back. And in the next three years, he and the Mavericks kept trucking away, each time winning more than 50 games in the regular season, with Dirk making his usual all-star and all-NBA teams. But the playoff success eluded them, and they couldn't get past the first or second round. Championship season. Before the 2010-2011 season, almost nobody saw the Mavericks as the title contenders. Nope, I counted them out. Um, I was also part of it. Like, it really looked like he was just, he was that guy who can't get it done in the playoffs. You know, regular season wonders, basically. But when the playoffs came in and the pressure time came in, I didn't see Dirk as that guy who could finish the job. So I wrote, I wrote the Dallas Mavericks off by this point. I never thought they would pull off what they pulled off. Dirk was 32, Jason Terry was 33, and Jason Kidd was 37 years old. Yeah. They only added Tyson Chandler to the existing team. Tyson but Chandler is another guy where Mark Cuban regrets not uh, not treating him properly as far as like giving him the contract that, that he should have given him. You know, he let him go. Everyone believed that they were supposed to be good enough to make the playoffs and then fizzle out in the first or second round like usual. But suddenly, yep. it all started to click. Tyson Chandler held the entire defense. Jason Kidd controlled the pace, and Dirk couldn't miss a shot. The Mavs won the first round against Portland in six games. Then they swept Kobe and the Lakers, who were the defending champions. Yeah, that one shocked. That shocked me. I don't know about you guys. When that happened, I'm like, huh. Like, what the hell's up with Dallas? Like, are they for real this time? Cause yeah, they they just they just took out a hell of good Kobe led uh, a Lakers team, but yeah, it gets better. In game one of the conference finals against the Thunder, Nowitzki scored 48 points and set an NBA record of 24 consecutive free throws made in a game and a record for most free throws in a game without a miss. They would defeat Durant, Westbrook, and Harden in five games and secure another finals duel with the Miami Heat, where they were a heavy underdog in the finals against LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, and Chris Bosh. We all thought this was going to be a sweep. I mean, if, if if you were around during this time and you remember this and you felt differently at that time, let me know, because everybody that I was I was hanging out with talking to, like we were just like, oh, man, poor Dirk, you know, these guys are and, and poor Jason Kidd at that point, because it was like this is Jason Kidd's what, like third, I think third uh, finals appearance. And I was like, man, those poor guys, they're about to get swept because this is like so lopsided. You know, this was not fair. This was not seen as fair back then. This kind of a super team. But 
coach. But even though the Heat had more superstars, the Mavs had a more balanced team. They also had Dirk, who played the best and the most clutch basketball of his career. Yep. In game two, Dirk scored the final nine points for the Mavs. And, and they had LeBron choking. Like, this was, this was LeChoke confirmed. That's the real reason why this happened, in my opinion. If, if LeBron played, if you swap out LeBron and, and uh, Jordan, if Jordan was in that position, uh, yeah, they would have swept Dallas probably. <laughs> so there would have been no shot in hell. You know, MJ with Chris Bosh and Dwayne Wade, Haslam holding it down in there. Like, no way, dude. No way is any of this happening. And he, and Mario Chalmers is, is underrated as well because, I mean, what did, what did MJ have? He had BJ, BJ Armstrong, and then he had uh, Ron Harper, which Ron Harper's, you know, legit, but not an actual point guard. So he had a, a legit point guard in, in Chalmers who could also hit the deep ball. Yeah, there's no way in hell. But that's before I realized LeBron was a choker. That I That's how I understood it. Like, that ain't MJ. That is nothing like MJ. That's not nothing like Kobe. This guy's not that guy. But he rose to the occasion, and thanks to him choking on his team, damn, man. I'll never forget this series. This is the craziest NBA Finals ever. Led a Dallas rally from an 88-73 fourth quarter deficit, making a left-handed driving layup over Bosch. Well, sick, by the way tie the series at one apiece. Despite having the flu in game four and in a true Jordan-esque manner, Nowitzki persevered and hit the winning basket to tie the series at two to two. Look at him Dallas with the went on out. to win the next two games with incredible performances from the entire team. But it was Nowitzki who pulled the most when it was the most important and he deservedly won the finals MVP. 100%. Dirk averaged 10 and a half points in the fourth quarter of that series. In four playoff series in 2011, Nowitzki averaged 28 points per game with 46% shooting from three and an incredible 94% from the free throw line. Damn. Where it seemed like he couldn't miss. No, he is like ultimate clutch. Ultimate clutch. Legendary one-legged fadeaway finally got recognition as one of the deadliest offensive moves in NBA history. Oh, yeah. And Nowitzki was finally crowned and got the praise he deserved for all his hard work. Post-championship years and legacy. The Mavs didn't retain some key pieces from their championship team, coming into the lockout shortened 2012 season, such as Deshaun Stevenson, J.J. Barea, and Tyson Chandler. Yeah, that was, by the way, <laughs> J.J. got the best of uh, LeBron in that in that final series, too. Him and uh, Jason Terry, the little guys. Um, yeah, I can't believe he didn't re-sign Tyson Chandler, though. Tyson Chandler was a huge part uh, of why they won. They finally had that solid defense. Between him and Marion... They had a solid defense, and that's what they were lacking earlier on because they were just a run-and-gun team without that defense. But, yeah, that was a big mistake by Cuban. I agree with him. That was, he, he, he fucked up there. Dirk was still a good enough captain to steer the Mavericks ship to the postseason in the next several years, but they would always sink at the first obstacle. After 2011, Nowitzki never won another playoff series. Despite the lack of team success, Dirk had plenty to be happy about. In 2017, he became only the sixth player in NBA history to reach 30,000 points. In the same year, he won the well-deserved Teammate of the Year award. Wow. In 2019, at the age of 40, he finally retired, scoring 30 points in the last game in Dallas. His 21 years years with the same franchise became a new NBA record, which is likely not going to be broken soon. His loyalty to the Mavericks is one of the greatest in sports history. He's still there. He's still there supporting Luka. Um, so, like, the two of them are buddies, and you'll see Dirk, if you ever watch any Dallas games, Dirk's at, like, half of those games. Especially if we know that he agreed to a smaller salary on three different occasions and that he could have been $194 million richer if he insisted on maximum deals. Dirk never even had a manager. He only wanted to win, and he wanted to win in Dallas. That is why his career is special, and that is why his only title is special. Mm -hmm. Luka it Doncic is. and Nikola Jokic are more talented. Giannis is infinitely more athletic, and Tony Parker has won more rings. But Dirk Nowitzki is still the best European player ever and one of the best power forwards to play the game, a pioneer who played a brand of basketball 15 years ahead of his time. Best European player ever. Do you guys agree with that? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, he might be. He damn well might be. He damn well might be.
that was just a surprising statement. That was a bold statement. So <laughs> I was kind of caught off guard by that. But yeah, that's uh, that's the history of Dirk Nowinski. Um, man, it was, it's uh, I, I saw something a while ago, like a couple years ago, and it was like really covering the relationship between him and his uh, his trainer. And they were just, it was like an hour of footage of, of the two of them training. I'll try and find it if you guys are interested. Uh, maybe I could uh, I could watch that with you guys. It's been a long time and I don't remember much of it. I just remember like, it was really cool to, to, to see such unorthodox methods of training. Especially nowadays where everyone is training the exact same way. Like to see somebody train in such an oddball style, but become successful with it i think that's really cool that's how you get unique players like dirk you know there's nobody before and since who has played like dirk you know you can compare numbers and all that stuff but that's not what i'm talking about i mean like play style if you see him play nobody looks like him out there in the court but anyways, let me know what you think. Uh, let me know what other suggestions you guys have. I, I know I'm still missing like a good hundred players that I would, that we need to cover here. Um, so go ahead and throw some out there. I'll see if there's a, there's a couple I don't have on the list. And let's keep trucking through all these people because I don't know if you guys realize the point of this this channel yet. But the point of this channel is just to appreciate basketball and the great ones. You know, I'll cover some uh, some breaking news once in a while, but for the most part, this is an appreciation channel. You know, because basketball has given me a lot in my life; it's taught me a lot, and I, I appreciate the sport. So I just want to give back in some some way, and I want to give back in a positive way. All right, everybody, I'm out of here for tonight. Thanks for watching with me as always. Yeah, like, it makes this whole thing fun. Um, yeah, leave this video a like if you enjoyed it and uh, subscribe to the channel if you want more content like this. Hit that bell notification if you want to be notified tomorrow morning on my uh, next video drop. And yeah, have a wonderful night, everyone. All right. I appreciate you all. And uh, tell your loved ones you love them. We have tonight and be good to your people. All right. I'll do the same. All right. Peace out till tomorrow.